So we'll now look at an example of PCA where we think about it in terms of minimizing reconstruction error. So let's think about the MNIST data sets. Remember, th these are the handwritten digits that are widely used in machine learning to test kind of algorithms and things. So each digit, if you remember, is a 28 by 28 set of pixels. And each pixel is just a grayscale. So zero is white, one is black, and something between zero and one is gray. Okay. And there's 60,000 images in total. So the data matrix is a 60,000 by 784 matrix. Okay. And the data is available on Moodle. And I put a clean version of it on Moodle, so you can just download it. It's this mnist.rda data file. Okay. So if you download it and copy these commands in, you'll be able to follow along with this example. So to begin with, let's just look at the threes. Okay, so I've selected out here just the, the digits that are supposed to be a number three, and I've just plotted the first 12 of them. So we're gonna try and use principal component analysis to characterize the variation in these handwritten threes. Now, how much do these three vary? So, first of all, the first thing we can do is to look at the average three. So, if I do col means here, I get the, uh, the column uh, mean of my data matrix. And if I plot that using this plotting command, this is the, what the average handwritten three looks like, which is kind of like you'd expect the average of 60,000 different threes. So let's do PCA on these data. So I've used PR comp here. And just know I can't scale the data here because some of the cells are all zero. So they've got variant zero essentially. So I can't divide by the variance. So scaling, you, doing PCA with the rotate, uh, covariance matrix is not an option here. We have to use the covariance matrix. So apply this command. Okay. So as you know, the PCR, uh, the PR comp uh, outputs a list okay, with the eigenvalues, uh, which are sdev, well, there's square root of the eigenvalues, aren't they? The eigenvectors, which is the rotation, the, the column mean, which is the center here, uh, the variances, and x, which is the transformed coordinates. So if we just look at the first 12 principal components, we can plot them as well. So this is the first principal component. This is the most important principal component. Okay. And you, if you think about what this is doing, it looks like this is rotating the three forwards or backwards, slanting it forward or back. In that, if you think about, there's no change in the gray bit, okay, but the white and black uh, it, it indicates where the positive or negative values uh, of the loading. And so if the black is positive and the white is negative here, if you've got a, a positive um, multiple of this principal component, you're gonna be tilted towards the right. If you've got a negative uh, multiplication of it, you'll be tilted to the left. Okay, so you can look at these principal components and think about how they represent how each number three varies. So now let's think about reduced rank approximations to the data. So if we think about a model of the form as we had before, as some linear combination of the columns of U, where U is our matrix of eigenvectors, we can think about having just one column in U, two columns in U, 100 columns in U, you know, we can, we, we can form a re, uh, whatever rank approximation we want by choosing how many columns of U, how many eigenvectors to consider here. So to begin with, let's just have two eigenvectors. So let's think about digits that are the form X bar, the average three, you know, if I, we need that there, otherwise they don't look like threes anymore. Okay. X bar plus some multiples times the first eigenvector, plus some multiple times the second eigenvector. 
Now, if we try to reconstruct the data with r equals to 2 here, so I've used this command here with r equals to 2. So I've taken the first two coordinates of the transform variables and the first two eigenvectors. And then I've plotted the 12 digits and I've, I've added on the mean. Okay. So you can see there's some variation in these threes. They tend to vary in how they slant to the left or right, as we say, and then, then slightly in how thick the lines are as well. Okay. So a rank two approximation does represent some variability, but if you look at these 12 digits, they don't look a lot like our 12 digits we started with. Okay, they should be the same. The reason they're not the same is that we've only got a rank two approximation. The data were originally 784 dimensions, and we're just using two coordinates here. So our approximation, although it's the best possible rank two approximation, isn't great. But as you can see, even with this rank two approximation, we are capturing some mode of variation between the threes. So if we look at a scree plot here, so remember a scree plot is a plot of the eigenvalues or the square root of the eigenvalues, the standard deviations against their index, you can see they drop off fairly rapidly. So by the time you get to about the hundredth eigenvalue, they're all close to zero. Okay. So another way of plotting this is to plot the cumulative proportion of variance explained. So the eigenvalue um, over the sum of the eigenvalues so far. So by the time we get all the eigenvalues, we've explained 100% of the variance. And then we can think about how many eigenvalues, uh, how many um, components, particular components we need to explain 90% uh, or 95% of the data. So that's what I plotted on here. I plotted on lines at 90% and 95% of the total variance, and then I plotted down so you can see how many components we need. Okay. And it works out that we need 80 components and 80 bit of components to explain 90% of the data and 138 components to explain 95% of the data. OK. So now let's look at reconstructions using more than two variables. OK, so we did the reconstruction with R equals to two, a rank two approximation to our threes. Let's try a rank 10 approximation. Okay. So this is a bit better. We, we can see we started to get these ghostly bits floating around, which aren't great. Okay, They're not very realistic as threes. But you can see that we are getting more variation in the threes with 10 components. And they're starting to look more like the, uh, the original images we started with. Okay, so that was with 10 components, with 50 components, you get better still. We've still got some ghostly kind of shadows around, but we're getting a, a better approximation to the original threes. And then by 100 components, we've really got quite good approximation. There's still these shadowy bits, okay, because they're just dealt with by the uh, lower order principal components. But you can see that you know, if you look focus on this three here, it looks quite a lot like um, our original three. So we're getting better. By the time we get up to uh, 500 components, we're really very good, okay? The, the reconstructed threes look a, very, a lot like the original threes. So there are, there are still other artifacts. So there's a you know, blob here in that particular three, another blob here. So none of them are perfect, but we know from the theory that this is the best rank 500 approximation to this data set consists of all these threes. I just want to say as well that unlike the example we did in chapter three, where we just took a single image, you know, the peppers image, or we had the that um, image of the couples in the examples class. Okay. There we were doing the, S, the singular value decomposition on one image. OK, so I just took the Peppers image and did an approximation of that image. Here, 
I'm doing principal component analysis on all the threes at the same time. So the singular value decomposition, not just of a single image, but of 60,000 images. Well, there aren't 60,000 threes, are there? But however many threes there were, um, 6,000 threes, I was doing the principal component analysis of that 6,000 by 784 matrix. Okay, another thing we can do that's of interest, we can plot the first two transformed variables, the first two principal component scores. Okay. So here I've got my all my threes, okay, and all I've done for each one is plot the first principal component score against the sec uh, and the second principal component score on the y-axis. What we can think about then is what are our most extreme threes? Okay, if I pick out a three from over here and a three from over here and a three from up here and a three from up here, you know, what do those threes look like? So that's what we've got here. Okay. So this first three is the one with the smallest PC1 score. So it will be probably that data point just here. Okay, so that's this number three. If we take the the the, the most uh, the, the the three with the largest principal component one score, so that'll be this three over here, and put that, we get this three. So you can see that the first principal component score really tilts the three from something to the left. To slanting to the right. We can do the same with PC2, principal component score 2. Okay, so I, if I take the, the score with the minimum PC2 value and the maximum PC2 value, I get this 3 and this 3. And so we can see that PC2 really controls the thickness of the line, and the fullness of the 3. Okay. So now, just finally then, let's do PCA not on just the threes, let's do it on all the images. Okay. So the zeros, the ones, the twos, okay. and we'll just do the principal, uh, the singular value decomposition of that entire matrix. Okay. And remember, the PCA doesn't know about the label. It doesn't know the label, whether an image is zero or one or two or so on. Okay. I'm just training it here on the x's the images there's no there's no information about the y's past at all okay and although i could do this on all 60,000 images it takes a long time on my computer and i've got quite a good computer okay it takes me uh, it probably takes about five minutes in my machine to do so just to speed things up i've just selected a subset of 5,000 images to speed everything along so I've selected 5,000 images of all different types of digits, and I've then done a principal component analysis, and I've said I want just the, a rank two PCA. I only want the first two eigen uh, vectors. Okay. And then all I've done is plotted them. So I've got the first principal component score, the second principal component score. And what I've done here is plot them by, uh, color them, sorry, by their digits. So you can see the blue is the six, the red is a zero, the uh, orange over here is the ones. And what you can see from this plot is that principal component analysis has really separated these digits. I mean, it's not that it's not separated them cleanly, but it has pulled them apart to some extent. So the zeros look very different to the ones when we just look at their first two principal component scores. The threes look very different to the fours. Okay, and there's some overlap. There's a muddle in the middle. The nines and the eights uh, all look the same. The zeros, they're all very similar. Okay, so it doesn't pull them apart. But by doing PCA and all the images, we have some sense made the data easier to analyze. Yeah? If I had to train a model to predict the zeros from the ones here, I could do this using just the PC1 score. If I drew a line here, uh, a PC8, a PC1 score is zero, and said anything to the right of this is a one, anything to the left of it is a zero, if I only had zeros and ones, that'd be a great classifier. Yeah, that would work pretty well. So 
this is kind of the idea we're going to move on to using things like principal components analysis for building models and classifying. And this is how often how PCA is used.